So this morning, as I already mentioned, we're going to be talking about victory celebrations. We're going to be talking about uh, the aftermath of, of Abram. If you're with us last week, you know Abram went on this rescue mission to rescue his nephew Lot and all their family and, and things like that that had been stolen away. And so um, he, he was successful. So we're going to be talking about what comes next in the book of Genesis with this idea of victory celebrations. So if you want to turn and follow in your Bible, you're welcome to do so, or just follow the words on the screen behind me, Genesis chapter 14, starting in verse 17, going to verse 24. After Abram returned from, de- from defeating Kedor Laomer, the king and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Aner, to Eshkol, and to Mamre. Let them have their share. So we learn a few things about Abram and his character by watching him go through this victory celebration. And as I was settling with this idea of victory celebration as a theme for today, I thought, what a great fit for the basketball kids being here. But then one of the other emotions that I went through was, I'll be honest, a little bit of sadness. Because it took me back to just a few short months ago when I sat glued to my television screen for multiple nights on end watching my beloved Cleveland Indians crawl and scrape and claw their way through those playoffs and get to the 3-1 advantage over the historic Chicago Cubs, and I thought, it's in the bag. And then it escaped the bag all of a sudden. You know the story. We came back home. We just needed to win one game. We just couldn't make it happen. So I got sad remembering how close we were to celebrating a victory in the World Series. But it was shortly after that that I was reminded that I shouldn't be too sad for too long because it was only a few short months before that that the city of Cleveland was able to celebrate, right, with victory. So I want to just take us all back for one moment with one or two pictures to help us remember that the curse is broken, right? That there was that fateful day in Cleveland, the, the, the confetti was everywhere, the crowds were absolutely enormous and record setting. there was trophy presentations, there were people all over the place in the city of Cleveland in celebration of that long-awaited victory. We even had some in-the-trenches, on-the-ground pictures from Mike Barnes and company right down there in the midst of all the chaos. And of course, J.R. Smith's long-awaited search that was fruitless for a shirt. He apparently couldn't find one anywhere during the entire celebration, right? So we had our moment of victory celebration. And I bring it about just to help us get in this mindset of thinking about what it feels like to be right there in the midst of it. And to say this to all of us this morning, because maybe since it's been a while you have forgotten, or maybe there's a chance you've never heard, but I want to be very clear and say the curse is still broken, right? All right, so let's move on to this particular celebration in the book of Genesis, chapter 14. We can see that these two men who speak together, Melchizedek and Abram, are contrasted, but they're still connected. And here's what I mean by that. After arriving with provisions for Abram's men, Melchizedek bursts into this sort of doxology and he ascribes praise to the God Most High. He recognizes Abram's victory as evidence that God Most High has been blessing the life of Abram. Now we need to understand that the phrase that Melchizedek uses in the original language was actually somewhat common in his area in the Sumerian Canaanite religion. It was referring to this chief god in the hierarchy, the pantheon of the gods that they believed in within the Sumerian Canaanite religion. 
But when Abram gets a chance to speak in verse 22, he takes some of that language that Melchizedek can understand, but he adds a very important word to it. And we translate it in the English into Lord. He uses that name Yahweh. In other words, he says, you understand that there's something going on here. There's something supernatural. There's something spiritual happening. And I'll use your words to be in this moment with you. But he sort of then brings Melchizedek to this place to say, there's a fullness of God that I want you to see And it's not this chief God of the Canaanite pyramid of gods, but it's the one true God, the God called Yahweh, the Lord. But it's interesting to me that Abram, upon hearing um, this praise to this other God, he doesn't bolt the scene. He doesn't condemn the words of Melchizedek's blessing. He doesn't break off the fellowship meal that they are sharing together. But he still proclaims his allegiance to the God who has called him. Instead of distance or judgment, Abram seeks understanding. He seeks where are the commonalities that we share and tries then to lead Melchizedek to see the fullness of God that he has understood since he's been called by God. It reminds me of other examples of when this happens in Scripture where people who are being led by God instead of standing away in judgment or desiring distance actually come close to find commonalities and try to draw people to the fullness of God. Acts chapter 17, Paul is speaking to this Athenian crowd, this crowd of people who has, they have tons and tons of altars built everywhere because they worship all these uh, different gods. And so he says to them, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found even an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Paul walked around this entire area of Athens surrounded by these pagan altars, altars built to gods that he didn't believe in. And yet instead of judgment or or distance, he looked at all them and he said, I can see that you are a people who desires to have this connection with God. You even have this altar that says to an unknown God, and he says, I'm going to take you to, I'm going to give you an opportunity to hear about this God, that it looks like you want to worship, you want to be connected to. I want you to see the fullness of God. Or how about Jesus himself in Mark chapter 12, speaking with a group of Jewish leaders, and they're talking about what's the greatest commandment, right? And Jesus says, well, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so he gets a response from one of the men in the group. Well said, teacher, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all of your heart, with all of your understanding, with all of your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Again, not desiring to create judgment or distance, but meeting these people where they are, listening for how they are trying to engage in the world, in the spiritual dimension of our world, meeting them where they are, and then drawing them just a little bit by bit towards the true fullness of who God is. And I wonder today, do we as Christians, do we listen and act in the same way that Abram did, or that Paul did, or that Jesus did? Are we listening For when people around us talk about their religiosity. Now you may wonder, what in the world does that sound like, right? There aren't people who are uttering the names of the pantheon of Sumerian gods anywhere probably in your neighborhood or in your workplace. But I want to tell you that there are religious people all around you. Even if they're not fully aware of it, they probably wouldn't say they believe in God or that they uh, go to church or anything like that. But they are just as religious as somebody who does. And here's why. Because they have adopted a set of ideas or values that drives their lives most deeply. They've tied themselves to certain ideas or values, and those things drive their lives. That's what a religion does. It gives you your highest ideals and values, and it it brings you and ties you closely to them. So when you hear people speaking about things like loving their family... I mean, there are probably many folks out there who would say, I don't believe in God and I don't really go to church, but I love my kids. And that helps drive their lives. 
Or they might say, I just want to be prosperous. I just want to, I just want to get to a place where I can live a little bit more comfortably and, and, and safely. Or maybe they would say, I just want some peace in my life. I've got so much turmoil on all sides. Or maybe they just say, I want some rest. My life is crazy busy and I just want some rest. When people talk about the big ideas that drive their lives, whether it's peace or prosperity or love for family or, or rest, they're talking about their religiosity. Are we listening and finding things that we can affirm, things that we can agree on, things that are commonalities, and then drawing them like Abram or Jesus or Paul and saying there's a fullness to God because loving your family, wanting peace in turmoil, wanting security, none of those are bad things, but there's a God who provides all of them to you. Are we listening in the same ways that Abram was listening and responding? And one of the ways that Abram responds is that he is clearly determined to divest himself. He's determined to divest himself of all this accumulation of stuff that he has gathered from this successful rescue mission to get Lot and his family back. Have you ever spent time with someone that you would describe as radically generous? I mean, think in your mind, is there someone you spent time with who you would call radically generous? This is the kind of person you know that if you go out to dinner with them, you somehow won't even see the check. It'll disappear. Like, it, it'll be there a second, or maybe you don't even see it, and it's gone, right? And I think a lot of times in our minds, we think the most radically um, generous people are the most wealthy people. In my experience, that's not necessarily true. It's just people whose hearts are so overflowing with what God has done for them, they can't help but be generous radically as a result. I see that in Abram here. I see him as someone who wants to be radically generous because after he receives this blessing from Melchizedek, we're told that he gives away one-tenth of the plunder from this rescue mission that he was on. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but this is an area where you could, you could say this might be the first connection to the idea of a tithe in Scripture, a one-tenth giving. And there are reasons that that doesn't make sense because this one-tenth, this isn't increase or earnings, this is not income, this isn't uh, sheep from the flocks, it's not from the fields of Abram, it's, it's booty, it's plunder from a mission, right? And it's not being given to the, uh, the Israelite worship um, institution, it's being given to Melchizedek. Now, on the other hand, it is a gift that's freely given to someone out of grace, out of generosity, and it's given to a priest. So you can make the case that it is. Well, whether you want to make the case that it is or it isn't, I think we can all agree on one thing. This gift of one-tenth is done in graceful generosity, right? Because what does Abram owe the king of Salem, King Melchizedek? He owes him nothing, Melchizedek did not go with him. He wasn't an ally in the mission. He deserves nothing. He did not help to finance the mission. He deserves nothing. So Abram takes from what he has and he gives it freely, even though he is not bound or obligated to do so in any way, shape, or form. Graceful generosity. Now contrast that with the king of Sodom, right? In discussion with the king of Sodom, Abram refuses to retain any of Sodom's goods, any of those things that they brought back that had been taken away from Sodom. Remember, Abram had the right to keep anything. In this day and age, in the ancient culture, if you went on a mission like this and you brought back anything, whether it was yours or not to begin with, it was your right to keep any of it that you wanted to. Abram could have said to the king of Sodom, I'm keeping all of it. I'm keeping people, I'm keeping goods, I'm keeping everything because it's my right to do so. But that's not what we see. Other than what was needed to nourish his men, and other than what was due his allies, he says, I refuse to keep even a scrap of this. He uses a phrase, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal. We may say, not even a crumb of bread will I take that was yours. The phrase he uses is actually common language in the ancient world to divest yourself of ownership, to renounce ownership. Another one that's common in ancient literature is not a blade of straw or a splinter of wood, not the tiniest of particles will I keep for myself. 
I'm renouncing ownership and giving it back to you. And did you catch the specific reason why Abram says he refuses to keep anything that belonged to the king of Sodom? I love this part. So that you will never be able to say that you made Abram rich or prosperous. Why in the world would Abram care so much about that? Here's what I think. I think he realizes he's already made this mistake once back in Egypt. He took with him a whole lot of stuff back from Egypt. And I think that he's grown in his understanding and relationship with God to the point where he's saying, I don't want anybody to be able to claim they made me rich or wealthy or prosperous because it's only God who is going to make me prosperous and get all of the credit and the glory and honor. The king of Sodom, the king of Egypt, none of them deserve the credit for keeping me in the place where I am. So he gives everything away, everything. And it's, it's a crazy story on its own, but I think the craziest story, honestly, revolves around one person. I, and I would call him the shadowy priest figure, right? This Malchizedek figure. It's like he comes out of nowhere. He's not mentioned in the story up until this point. He won't be mentioned again. In fact, there are very few references to him in the Old Testament even about who he is, what he does. He doesn't really seem to have an active role. He's this mysterious figure. Reminds me of of someone from my childhood watching cartoons. Does anybody recognize this picture up here? Yes, somebody does. Do you know who that is? You know the show, but you don't know his name. That's half credit. What's the show? Inspector Gadget. I probably watched every episode of the show growing up at least three times, right? I could sing you the whole song, but I will not, but I could. So in that show, there is this shadowy figure who is critical to the story. He's like the main bad guy, right? Remember his name? Dr. Claw. Yeah, right? But here's the catch. Here, here's why he's, to me, shadowy and mysterious. Do you know how many times in all the original episodes you see the face of Dr. Claw? None. You never see his face. He is this shadowy figure. He has a huge role to play, but he's got this mystery surrounding him. And I'm not trying to say that Melchizedek is the bad guy. He's not, but he has this sort of mystery. I mean, here's what I mean by that. Think about the story. He appears with really no prelude, it's a big surprise that he enters in. He's not somebody that's been in the story or even referred to, and then boom, all of a sudden, he's present there, and then he leaves mysteriously. He's, he's both a priest and a king of this place called Salem, which I think is interesting, but it, it, it is another name for, in the ancient times, Jerusalem was also called Salem for short. So he's a priest and a king that comes from near or in Jerusalem. And what does he bring with him? He brings bread and wine. Now here's why that's strange. Even if you wanted to be generous, if Melchizedek wants to be generous to this troop of men who have made this mission, all he really needs to bring to be generous is bread and water. That's already generous enough. But he brings bread and wine. Which in that day, if you brought something like bread and wine, it wasn't just for nourishment. It was culturally the idea of celebrating like a royal banquet. In other words, Melchizedek gives Abram and his men far more than they need or they deserve. Mysterious. And his abundant generosity really contrasts with the king of Sodom. Melchizedek, we're told, brings a gift. What is the first word out of the king of Sodom's mouth? Give me. On one hand, you have someone who wants to give. On the other hand, someone who wants to take. So just on the surface, in this story, Melchizedek appears to be somebody who is not a Jewish person, but recognizes the presence and the power of God. Someone, if you're familiar with the stories, like Rahab or Ruth or Naaman, or even the Magi or the Centurion in the story of Jesus, someone who's kind of on the outside but looks and recognizes that there is something happening, that there is this God who is at work. But the thing is, it doesn't stop in the Old Testament with Melchizedek. It moves on. The writer of the New Testament book of Hebrews, especially in chapter 7, just absolutely latches on to this idea 
of this Melchizedek guy who is sort of kind of mysterious and applies it to Jesus. I mean, you can see why. Think about it. Was Jesus' birth a surprise? Absolutely. Even the people who were most studied in how he's supposed to arrive didn't see it coming. And then, boom, he's on the scene. The way that he taught was mysterious and strange. The way that he died, messiahs don't die. Messiahs conquer. Everything about him was surprising on the scene. Jesus is our high priest and also a king in ascended glory, a priest and king from the area of Jerusalem. Jesus gives us extravagantly more than we need or deserve, just like Melchizedek did. And the big function of chapter 7 in Hebrews is this the idea, because of what Jesus has done, everything that came before Jesus in this line of laws and ordinances and sacrificial systems has now been set aside and made null and void. Because the, the idea is that Abram was blessed by someone greater than him. The greater blesses the lesser. And so if Abram was blessed by Melchizedek, Melchizedek is somehow greater. And if the entire system of sacrifices and laws came through Abram's lineage, then there's something greater, bigger, grander even than that. So the author of Hebrews latches on to it. And I love this part. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the entire system, the law and the sacrifices, we're told, have been set aside because it was weak and useless. But a better hope is introduced. It finishes up in Hebrews chapter 7. Listen to these words. Because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood, and he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. It means that we no longer need justification or intercession or forgiveness from any other source. We're just told, draw near to this Jesus, this priest in the order of Melchizedek, someone who's bigger, greater, and grander than anything who had come before him. Or maybe we could put it this way. You are free from trying to justify yourself. You are free from trying to earn forgiveness. And you are free from the lonely feeling that no one cares enough to stand for you. Because Jesus has justified you. Jesus has forgiven you. And Jesus makes intercession for you. Or maybe to make it full circle, I should just say this. My friends, whether you've forgotten about it or maybe never heard it before, the curse is broken. You don't have to find justification in yourself for yourself. You don't have to create forgiveness by earning it. And there is one who stands for you because he is for you. So as we finish our time, I want to give you a couple things to think about before we share in communion together. The first one is this. Today, take a moment of silence to ask God to help you listen to and discern the religious language of the people who are closest to you. Ask God to give you the wisdom to respond with respect and and affirmation or invitation. Listen to what's driving the lives of the people around you and then invite them further into the fullness of who God is, the God that has called you just as he's called Abram. Or maybe take a minute to assess where are you on that generosity scale? We talked about being radically generous. Are you seldom generous, often generous? Are you radically generous? Or maybe this question, what more might God be calling you to give away? How might God grow your heart to follow in the radically generous footsteps of someone like Abram? Or lastly, if nothing else today, just thank God for the generous gift of Jesus, the one who is the great priest and king. Take a moment today to accept or, or celebrate his forgiveness, his justification, and the intercession that he gives because of who he is and because of what he has done for all of us. So take a moment if you want to pray, if you want to close your eyes, bow your head, if you just want to read through those words. We're going to have a moment of silent reflection, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to share in communion together.